So good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to uh, this KTN webinar. Um, so this is part of the Microbiome Innovation Network. Um, and today we're going to be hearing from um, some speakers currently um, in the early stages of research or students still, um, finding out a bit about their work with the microbiome um, and um, hopefully some challenges maybe and how they've overcome these. So I'm just going to start with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so just due to the large numbers that have um, registered um, and are here today, thank you all for it, for coming along. Um, but you you will be and hopefully are all muted um, and this will stay the case throughout uh, the webinar. That's just to make it a bit easier for our speakers today. Um, Hopefully uh, you should be able to connect your audio using the join audio button um, and that will help you to actually hear the presentations, which of course is helpful. If you do have any technical issues um, during any of the presentations, there should be a chat box um, at the bottom of your screen. So if you use that for any technical problems, uh, then Poonam will be able to help you with that. Um, the other box at the bottom is a Q&A box. So if you have any questions for the speakers, um, if you pop those in the Q&A box, not the chat box, um, and then I will be able to get through those at the end. Um, there should be, I believe, a sort of thumbs up icon. So if you see a question in there that you really like, um, or there's a question that's that you were going to ask, if you hit the thumbs up, then the most popular questions should come uh, to the top of my screen so we can get through the popular ones first. Um, and the final thing to note is that the webinar is recorded, um, so please bear that in mind, um, and it will be made available to um, attendees and everyone else by the KTN website. So just a quick introduction, firstly to me. Uh, hello, my name is Sophie Hazelden. I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Leeds. Um, my research has been looking at um, uh, the, oh, sorry, next slide. Uh, my research has been looking at um, zinc oxide in um, pigs, so in post weaning diets. Um, and as part of that, I've been looking at performance effects and mainly gut health broadly. So um, obviously a large part of that has included looking at the microbiome. Um, so uh, a few months ago, I started a virtual placement with KTN um, and uh, I've been working within the Microbiome Innovation Network uh, with them. So the Microbiome Innovation Network is actually one of many networks within KTN um, and these uh, support areas of high uh, potential and capability within the UK. Um, and one of the ways that uh, KTN does this is through building networks. And the Microbiome Innovation Network specifically um, aims to uh, build a proactive and self-sustaining microbiome community. And working within that, I wanted to sort of branch this out a bit more to students, early careers, and um, sort of us guys as next generation of um, people working within the microbiome area. So today you will hear from five speakers that um, are exactly that. They're in the early stages of working in the microbiome. And they will hopefully talk to you about their research um, across a vast area. So we have some human, animal and plant speakers today. Um, we'll hopefully hear about some challenges that they've faced, how they've overcome them or how they're still trying to overcome them. And hopefully with some follow up events, we'll form a bit of a network. We're all hopefully trying to achieve similar things, um, even across such broad areas. Um, so just trying to build a network that we can hopefully learn from each other um, and help each other through. So 
Um, I will start then with our first speaker today, who is Annabelle Cancel. I will stop sharing. Annabelle, if you'd like to start. So Annabelle is from the University of York and is currently a bioinformatician within Professor James Chong's lab. So Annabelle, over to you. Thanks, Sophie. So yeah, as Sophie says, I am Annabelle. I am a bioinformatician in the Chong lab um, at the University of York, but I am going to present sort of some work around my master's thesis, which I just finished in the same lab. Uh, so I'd like to talk to you today about building a reproducible pipeline for metagenomic analysis. Um, so just a bit of a background. Um, so we research anaerobic digestion, mainly of sewage sludge. It's very glamorous. Um, and our main aim is to maximise the amount of biogas produced. So we come at this from a microbial perspective. Uh, so the microbial communities in AD are large and rather complex. So we can have sort of around 500 species and these are largely unknown. Uh, therefore, we end up using metagenomics to sequence this whole community. Um, so the metagenomic data sets we usually produce comprise a time series of Illumina reads, so some short reads there, and then a pooled nanopore sequencing, which we then use for assembly. Um, in order to get anything of biological uh, meaning out of this assembly, we then need to taxonomically bin this. So this is what's known as clustering. Um, you can cluster sequences from um, an assembly using a variety of methods, but there's nothing available which really makes use of the kind of data we produce. So this time series of short reads and this pooled long read assembly. So this is where clustered comes in. So what is clustered? Uh, so please excuse the name. Uh, clustering using abundance changes of raw reads. Uh, this is an automated pipeline, so you can see uh, the steps it goes through on the left. This is built using a mixture of custom Python scripts and also some popular bioinformatics software. So the clustering step is mainly some Python scripts with a few uh, bioinformatics software. And then there's this analysis step, which might include some software that you've, you've heard of. So maybe Procker, CheckM, Kraken. Uh, so how this works is it bins an assembly using a change in abundance of sequences across the time series. And then these clusters that are produced from this step are then passed into this downstream analysis, which then provides context to these results. Uh, so just a quick look at this, uh, the comparison, so how the clustering compares to other clustering methods. This um, is a log scale mock metagenome. So, uh, sorry, the thing in the bottom there. So this is from um, sequencing data, which is from this Nichols et al paper, and it has uh, genomic composition, so there's uh, species that are 89.1% abundant in this population and then down to 0.0089% uh, abundant. So as you can see here, the CONCOT um, is, produces, assembles quite a lot of the assembly, but is not overly correct. Um, the bases aren't always in the right place. And then Metabat assembles less of the assembly, but is very correct. So we found that clustered is sort of a nice balance between the two here. So it's a lot more correct than concoct um, and the actual clusters produced tend to actually contain what they should. And then uh, a lot more of the assembly is actually clustered in comparison to Metabat 2. So this one is a mock metagenome. We've also run this on a real world data set, quite a few actually. Uh, so this is a large, oh, sorry, if I can go back. This is a large, uh, real world data set, so it's a large AD community. And as you can see here, so this is with clustered and concoct. Unfortunately, Metabat 2, we couldn't get to run on our um, computing cluster here, but clustered here produces a lot more high quality uh, bins than concoct does. So this is based on the MIMAG standards, which some of you might be aware of. Uh, just to look at some of the analysis. So this is uh, one of the output plots from the analysis step. One of these is produced for each cluster. And it sort of gives a nice overview so you can easily glance and see what's there. So just look at it. Um, it shows you the cluster identity, some statistics, so the GC um, and the size of it and how many sequences are actually in this. It also shows uh, the check M results and also the Kraken results. So you can see sort of how complete and contaminated this cluster is and also sort of what um, taxonomy this is. And then it also shows the change in abundance of this cluster over time. So this is quite a complicated data set, which is why there's five different sets there. Uh, some of the other outputs here, so it produces uh, a relative abundance plot, which is nice, nice to glance at to see what you can do. I will say, I always take, so this is built using the Kraken identities. I always take results like this with a pinch of salt. It 
always look into it more later on, but this gives a good starting point. And it also gives other outputs here. So it's sort of this one will show you sort of the um, how well the assembly, how well the assembly has actually been clustered. And this shows how well um, each of the contigs or the sequences of the assembly have been binned as well. Uh, so what is the impact here? So clustered itself can be running under a day on very large data sets. I have managed that over sort of a 200 gigabytes worth of sequencing data, which is great. I will say this is on a uh, computing cluster. It can be run on a local computer, but it would need rather a lot of memory for both CheckM and Kraken. They need sort of 40 gigabytes of memory there. Uh, so far, we've run it on nine different data sets, and these use a variety of microbial environments and also a mix of sequencing technology. And our clustering results are at least on par with other methods. And this provides a great starting point for further analysis. So the annotation, or we can look into metabolic pathways, et cetera, once we have um, the bins and we know what's there in the community. Uh, so I'd just like to briefly talk about the technology that has uh, enabled me to do this. Um, so it's built using the workflow manager, SnakeMake. This allows for portability, so you can easily run it on any Unix machine. It doesn't need, it needs minimal install. In fact, all you need to install is Snake, make everything else is handled by it. It's very reproducible. As I said, I've run it on nine different data sets, probably about 50 times in total, testing things and trying different things out. Um, it's also very scalable. So I don't know how many of you are um, familiar with running things on computing clusters, but um, sending hundreds of jobs off to a computing cluster is a nightmare. Luckily, SnakeMake handles this all for you, which is great. Uh, so how it works is it chain, chains blocks of code. So you can see this rule over here. This is one of them uh, together to build a pipeline. So these are sort of the building blo blocks of the pipeline. And you can use a mixture of bioinformatics software and custom scripts here. Um, and therefore, it's easy to alter the parameters and also the pipeline itself. You can easily take out steps and add things back in and change how something works quite quickly. So what's the downside? So the biggest downside, I say, is the initial setup time. So maybe with something like Clustered, it's definitely worth it for the amount of times we're going to run it. And we have run it so far. It's probably saved a lot of time, but it won't necessarily save this. Uh, if it's something that you'd run maybe twice and takes 10 minutes, maybe not worth that time. It does get complicated very fast. Um, this is quite a complicated pipeline and state make makes it even harder. Uh, it's a very different way of thinking than actual normal sort of pipelines and programming. Uh, but it is, it is hard to make it unbreakable as well. So as you can see here, things fall apart quite easily. Uh, I've tried to make it as unbreakable as possible, but a chain is only as good as its weakest link. So, Luckily, SnakeMake handles most of the things within the pipeline, but if you give it a dodgy input at the start, then nothing will work. Um, and just to quickly wrap up, so I touched on this, but metagenomic analysis is a complicated and long process. So, um, and workflow managers strengthen data analysis. So if you're any way inclined, I would look into this and see how it can strengthen your research. Um, and reproducibility is great, and we really want to see that. And also Clustered itself gives a good starting point for further analysis. Um, so just quick thanks to James and Sarah and the rest of the Chong Lab, Anna, uh, Alessi, John Davey, Sally James, and the Bioinformatics and Genomics Labs, Viking, which is a high performance computing cluster, and the Time Project and Yorkshire Water for funding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annabelle, that was great. Um, so we will now pass over to our second speaker, Dr. Katie McDermott, who I actually work quite closely with at the University of Leeds. Katie is a postdoc um, here or at Leeds um, and has experience in both ruminant and monogastric animal microbiome research. So over to you, Katie. Yep, thanks, Sophie. So yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, some 16S RNA sequencing, involving the livestock microbiome, but I'm really going to focus on some of the challenges that I faced and hopefully some tips for those of you starting out in microbiome sciences. So who am I? As Sophie said, I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Leeds. Uh, my interest is animal science, particularly animal nutrition, but I have a strong interest in the gut microbiome and gut health not only for helping an animals through disease challenge, but also for uh, increasing sustainability and productivity of livestock systems as well. 
My PhD was in cattle, uh, but I now work with pigs. And that's sort of the beauty of microbiome science. The skills that you learn, you can really apply it to pretty much any environment you can think of. So my PhD uh, was broadly looking at ways to improve fiber digestion in cattle. So in the rumen of cattle, and that was through manipulating the bacterial community that lives there. Uh, and for this, I was using an in vitro model in the lab, which are these bottles you can see at the bottom of the screen. So I really wanted to dig down into the dynamics of the fermentation that was going on within the cow. So uh, how were these bugs digesting this fiber? And uh, which bacteria do you need to have present to be able to do this well? By the end of my PhD, uh, the, the things we were looking at had really changed. It had gone from looking at fiber digestion in the cow to trying to understand the effects that the model were actually having on the bacterial community. So the way that this model works was actually having strong effects on the bacterial composition we were seeing with the sequencing. In vitro models are really, really popular for looking at ways uh, that different feedstuffs can affect the animal before you actually give it to the animal. And uh, more and more people are looking at the effects on the microbiome as well. But it's really important that we first understand the effects the model itself is having on that microbiome before we introduce treatments into that as well. So why might you ask? Uh, a lot of people have asked me why. I spent four years of my life looking at this. But our ruminant animals, so our cattle, our sheep, our goats, are globally important livestock species for their meat, their milk, and their fibers. And uh, ruminants have evolved a multi-chambered forestomach that allows them to digest plant material. So mammals can't digest this. We don't have the enzymes to do it. But ruminants have got this huge uh, collection of microorganisms in their forestomach that break down these plant fibers for them. So you often hear that cattle have four stomachs, and that's not technically true. Um, they have this multi-chambered four stomach, and there are four parts to it, but only the fourth one, the last part, which is called the abomasum, is actually a gastric stomach. The other three have evolved to help the animal digest plant material and to absorb water. And it's the first part of that that I focused on, so the rumen, which is where the ruminants get their name from. So uh, rumen allows them to digest plant materials, so cellulose, and it's because of this whole host of uh, microbes that live there. So we have bacteria, we have archaea, protozoa, fungi, viruses, and they all work symbiotically within that rumen to help the animal. In just a milliliter of rumen fluid, there's around 10 to the 11 bacterial cells. So it's really jam packed in there with the number of bugs that we have. So the rumen is really a huge fermentation vat um, and it can hold, depending on, on the ruminant animal, hundreds of litres of content. So there's loads and loads of microbes found within the rumen. Um, so these animals can digest fibre, they can do it really well, but some animals can do it much better than others. So even when you keep a lot of factors the same, so you use animals of the same genetics on the same farm with the same management fed the same feed, you still see variation between the individuals. Uh, and the question is why? And that's likely due to the microbes that live within uh, the forestomach stomach of these animals. So I should say they do still have microbes in their hindgut, in their intestines, the same way that we do, but it's really this foregut that we're interested in with, with the ruminants. So if you look at animals on the same farm, digesting the same diet, you have some that are very efficient and some that are more inefficient. And uh, there's studies out there that show that efficient animals have a different microbial population to inefficient ones. So there's a lot of interest in looking at inefficient animals and seeing how we can manipulate their microbiome to look more like that of an efficient animal. So I'll run through uh, techniques briefly. So uh, I was extracting DNA from rumen content using a commercial kit with an additional bead beating step. I amplified uh, the V1 to V3 region of the 16S gene. So the 16S rRNA gene is a marker for bacteria. And this gene has nine hypervariable regions. So you see them from V1 through to V9. And uh, these hypervariable regions allow us to determine which bacteria is which. So using this technique, you can look to about the genus level 
depending on how many of these variable regions that you sequence will give you depth to go down more towards the species. So I amplified V1 to V3, uh, purified it and sent it to our in-house uh, sequencing unit. They prepared the libraries and uh, loaded it onto the sequencer. And for this, I used an Illumina MySeq with 300 base pair, pair end reads. They sent the data back to me and I performed the bioinformatics in-house using uh, mother and downstream analysis in R. So um, I really wanna go through some of the challenges that I faced then. So when I did this at the start of my PhD, nobody in the school had done this before. So it was really quite isolating. As somebody that had never done this, I was a complete beginner. I thought, have I got myself in over my head? Am I gonna be able to do this? And it was quite isolating not having that support network there. Next, I said I used uh, Mother for my bioinformatic pipeline. And uh, Mother has a really, really good SOP available. So to talk you through how to use all these steps. Uh, and you can use some mock samples on there to practice. So practice, got my sequences, thought I knew what I was doing, and I couldn't get Mother to recognize my files. And I spent more time than I would like to admit trying to work out how, what was going wrong. I started to panic, have I wasted all this money? Are my sequences wrong? Um, but it was a really, really simple thing that I hadn't done. I just needed to unzip my files another time. And looking back now, it was such a small thing, but as a complete beginner, it did really, really throw me. Um, unlike Annabelle with her fancy high powered computing, um, I did my analysis on my desktop PC in my office and it took a really long time with quite a small amount of samples. So I was only using just under 40. And um, some of the steps were taking over a week to run. And that was largely due to the variable region I was using. So um, I was generating quite big files and these big files take up a lot of processing uh, time. So the V1 to V3 region that I used is about as long as you can get with the 16S reads. So it reads 300 base pairs in each direction when you do the sequencing. So you have 300 from the front and 300 from the back. And then you get a little bit of overlap in the middle. And that overlap allows you to join those reads together when you do the bioinformatics. Now with the V1 to V3, that overlap region was quite small. Uh, the more overlap you have, the better the quality your data will be, the less error you'll have because it's been read in both directions and the smaller your files will be because there's less error. So that leads to smaller file sizes that are generated and will really improve your, your processing time if you're using this on a desktop. Other challenges that I faced, so uh, finally got mother to work, got to the end, and I could not work out how to get it into R. <laughs> so there was no instructions from mother's side of how to move it. Found really, really good instructions once I'd got it into R, but I had this step in the middle um, and again, it took me a lot longer than I thought it would to work out how to actually move it across. R itself, um, I'd only used briefly as part of an intro to stats course. Uh, so even though there was all these great tutorials available to me, I wasn't confident using R uh, and I could probably do a whole talk on challenges I faced using R as well. So I would say if you are starting out in this, uh, use R in your day-to-day -day stats as well try and get used to it and how it works. And a bit of a lighthearted one, but pronunciation of bacterial names. I still struggle with some of them and I don't think some of them I've ever said the same way twice. <laughs> so some words of wisdom then, if I can call them that, I would say consider data size and storage early. Uh, it will take up a lot of space. So make sure you've got somewhere where you can back that up. Think about whether you need access to high powered computing. And this will really depend on uh, the computer you've got available to you, as well as the number of sequences you're trying to process. Variable region choice is really, really important. So I touched on it a moment ago with these large file sizes, but um, there's no real gold standard in the literature for which variable region you should choose. It varies uh, within a field as well as across fields. So um, when I started out, I was told to only compare studies that had looked at the same variable region. So I did a big scan of the literature and found the most commonly one that was used for the rumen. And at that time it was V1 to V3. Um, now I've, I'm looking at V4 when I do my sequencing because it gives us a much better 
overlap of those sequencing reads, but this really will vary with your um, with your goal. So do you want to get down to the species level? If you do, you need to sequence as many of those variable regions as you can. Um, and also uh, your field as well. So in um, marine environments, for example, in the literature, you tend to see more V6 compared to V4 in human and livestock, but it really will depend. And I would say include negative controls and mock communities in your pipeline. Journals, particularly uh, very high impact journals are increasingly looking for this. So if you can get them into your pipeline now, all the better. So just some take home messages. I think microbiome science is an incredibly exciting area of science. It's had a huge boom in the last sort of seven to eight years and I don't see that slowing down. The skills that you learn can be applied to a wide range of areas. And we're constantly learning more and more about the effect of these bugs, uh, not only in their location, but the wider impacts as well. So in the human body, for example, the bugs that are in the intestine are being shown to have uh, effects across the whole body. But I will say the microbiome is more than just the bacteria. So um, the bacteria, especially in our complex environments are really just the tip of the iceberg. So um, for the rumen, for example, we have bacteria, we have archaea, protozoa, viruses, fungi, and these all work together as a network. So we need to understand how all of these bugs work together and function. For my in vitro model, what was happening is that we were losing the protozoal population through the way that we were processing uh, the rumen fluid. And the protozoa predate on bacteria. So if you take these out of the system, uh, you're losing an element of control on that bacterial community. So that was allowing this community to, to change. And it's more than just who is there. So I was looking with 16S sequencing at who is present, but you can also look at what genes they have, what proteins they're producing and what metabolites they're producing. Um, and this whole network of uh, omics technologies are really going to be the future of moving to uh, moving forward. I do want to say you're not alone. Um, there's brilliant online forums and discussion boards and networks like this are here to support you. And we do also have problems. So no matter how experienced you are, there will still be something that catches you out. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Katie. Certainly um, quite a lot of challenges faced there that I'm certain other people will have uh, definitely found the same. So thank you very much for that. So we'll move on now to our third speaker, Sam Prudence from the John Inn Centre and the University of East Anglia. Sam's work is broadly around the plant microbiome. You're actually our only plant microbiome speaker of the day. Um, and specifically looking at agricultural varieties of wheat. So over to you, Sam. Cool, thank you. Uh, yeah, so as Sophie said, uh, I'm Sam Prudence. I'm based at the John Inn Centre. Um, and I work in Matt Hutchings Group. And uh, my work focuses on the microbiome associated with the roots of wheat. Um, so just briefly, uh, why are we interested in this? Well, as we've heard, um, with a lot of different systems already today, uh, these microbiomes can have some important uh, properties within their environment. So for example, um, within the roots of wheat, the uh, microbes that reside there can help suppress disease. They can increase the availability of nutrients from the soil for the plants, and they can contribute to abiotic stress relief against things like salt stress or drought. Um, but this is a highly complicated network of microbes so we have you know bacteria we have archaea uh, one moment i'm just going to get the laser pointer bacteria archaea fungi other micro eukarya all interacting with each other and interacting with the host plant so um, if we ever want to utilize the capabilities of this community to benefit crops perhaps to replace pesticides or chemical fertilizers uh, it's important to understand how these interactions result in those plant beneficial effects uh, so just briefly, when we study the root microbiome, typically this is divided into three compartments. So we have the bulk soil, which is the, the soil that's not associated with the plant root. Um, everything in the plant root microbiome is acquired horizontally from the soil. So understanding the community composition in the bulk soil is a really important factor to take into account because that community composition will determine the community you find within the roots. Um, then we have the rhizosphere, which is a thin layer of soil closely associated with the surface of the roots. 
Uh, plants actually exude about 30 to 40 percent of their photosynthetically fixed carbon from their roots as a complex mixture of compounds called root exudates. These are sugars, organic acids, fatty acids, among other things. And it's thought they do this to actually modify the microbial community in the rhizosphere. Um, and lastly, we have the endosphere, which refers to the interior of the root. Uh, so firstly, I just want to talk briefly about one of the first experiments I did in my project, um, which was just kind of a very basic survey to try and understand which microbes we find present in these root compartments. Uh, so I sampled some wheat plants that were grown at Church Farm, which is the John Inn Center's uh, field study site. So this was grown in an agricultural setting. These fields are still used for uh, actual commercial wheat farming. Uh, and I sampled those three compartments, which I mentioned. Uh, importantly, the endosphere, before we extract DNA from it, uh, the roots are surface sterilized, so we can be sure that any microbial DNA in those samples comes from the interior of the root. Um, now, for these experiments, we're extracting DNA directly from the plant tissue, so the vast majority of that is going to be host-derived genomic DNA. You know, uh, so if we were to do wheat, uh, sorry, if we were to try and do metagenomics, the chances are we'd essentially just be sequencing the wheat genome. So, instead of doing that. Um, metagenomics, which we're working on, but is obviously very challenging because of how much host-derived DNA there is. Uh, we use PCR-based metabarcoding methods that kind of like what we've just heard about. So for this, I've, I did the bacterial 16S ribosomal RNA gene. Um, I also did the uh, archaeal 16S ribosomal RNA gene. It's important to make sure if you're interested in archaea that you're using archaea-specific primers because the generic bacterial primers are not very good at capturing archaeal diversity. And then also sequence the ITS4 region to profile the fungal community. And again, that's fungi-specific primers. Um, so that's all sequenced with Illumina, and I used the CHIME2 pipeline to analyze that data. Um, so from that, we can get a plot like this, which is the uh, each of these bars shows the mean relative abundance of each microbe within the soil, the rhizosphere, or the endosphere. Um, so these are quite busy figures. There's a lot going on. Um, as someone was saying earlier, they're a good starting point before you do further analysis. And the thing that struck us here was that we see these two groups, Streptomyces and Burkholderiaceae, uh, massively increase in abundance in the endosphere compared to the rhizosphere or the bog soil, which would imply they're being enriched in that community. Um, Species within these two groups are known to be plant beneficial. So these are obviously some interesting groups to potentially follow up with further study. Um, so to, to kind of interrogate that a bit further, I used a software package called DSIG2, which you can run in R. Um, and this, some people may be familiar with for analyzing RNA sequencing data, but it's actually a really powerful statistical tool to try and identify microbes which are changing in abundance across these root compartments when you have these types of compositional data sets. So we have, for example, significantly increased abundance of Burkholderiaceae from the bog soil into the rhizosphere, and then for Streptomycetaceae from the rhizosphere to the endosphere here in green, again, significantly increased relative abundance. Um, so that kind of demonstrates that these are in fact being enriched within this community. So I mentioned that plants exude 30 to 40% of their photosynthetically fixed carbon as root exudates to modulate the community. Um, so the question we have is, are these microbes that we see enriched in the endosphere or in the rhizosphere utilizing these plant-derived compounds? Um, if they are, then that would imply the plant is you know, selectively recruiting these microbes into its root microbiome by feeding it with this carbon from these root exudates. So to investigate this, we use a method called stable isotope probing. So you can feed the plant with 13 carbon labeled CO2, so heavy 13 carbon CO2, the stable isotope of carbon. And as the plant uh, fixes that CO2 um, and incorporates that 13 carbon into its metabolism, those root exudates are labeled with 13 carbon. Um, then, as the microbes in the rhizosphere and the endosphere utilize these plant-derived compounds uh, as a carbon source and for growth, they will incorporate that 13 carbon into their own metabolism and into the backbone of their DNA. So in this way, you can specifically label the DNA of microbes which utilize the root exudates 
or the plant derived compounds from the host plant with that 13 carbon. Uh, so I did this over this, this whole process takes a very long time. I did this with a good friend and colleague of mine, Jake Newitz, who's a fellow PhD student at the, uh, in uh, Matt Hutchings lab. And essentially what we did is we had two separate groups of plants, one which we labeled with that 13 carbon CO2 and a control group, which we labeled with that 12 carbon CO2. And we did this over a period of weeks, just manually injecting these sealed growth chambers with either 13 carbon or 12 carbon for the control. Um, after a period of growth, uh, I then extracted DNA from these plants in the same way as I described earlier. And we used density gradient ultracentrifugation to separate out that 12 carbon light DNA from the 13 carbon heavy DNA. And what this results in at the end for when we're doing the sequencing is um, two samples for each of the two sets of plants we had. For those 13 carbon um, labeled plants, we have the heavy 13 carbon fraction and the 12 carbon light fraction. And for the 12 carbon control plants, we also have a heavy and a light fraction, which is important to do because some microbial DNA is naturally heavier and will end up in this 13 carbon heavy fraction. So it's important to differentiate between microbes which just have heavier uh, DNA or microbes which just, um, or the microbes which are actually utilizing those root exudates and thus their DNA is heavier because they've incorporated that, that, in, that uh, 12 carbon. Um, so one way we can figure out whether this labeling has worked is by using uh, an ordination, so non-metric multidimensional scaling. So this is some analysis which Jake ran. Uh, and again, we do this in R. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar, to put it basically, each of these points represents the microbial community in one sample. And the closer together two points are on the graph, the more similar the community is in those samples. So you can see in the blue triangles here, we have the 13 carbon heavy samples, which cluster over here. And you can see that they cluster completely separately to the 12 carbon heavy samples, showing that that labeling process results in us finding a different community in that uh, heavy fraction after we've labeled the plants with 13 carbon. So that implies that the microbes that are in this community are not ones that just happen to have heavy DNA anyway, they're ones that are actually incorporating that 13 carbon label. And you can see the fractionation process um, where we separate out that 12 carbon light and that 13 carbon heavy DNA with the centrifugation also changes the community as we have those light fractions clustering over here separately to the heavy fractions up here and here. Um, so after this, we can then look at when the slide loads. One moment. Has that happened? There we go. Yeah, so we can again plot these on these bar plots. This is a very busy figure, so I won't spend long on this, but you know, just visually you can see that the community as a different, uh, when you were looking at the mean relative abundance, at least, you can see that the community is different in these different uh, samples. So to actually identify the microbes, which are utilizing root exudates, again, we can use that same software package DSIG2. Um, so the way that we chose to define this is we're looking for microbes which are significantly increased in abundance in the 13 carbon heavy fraction when compared to the 12 carbon heavy fraction. So we know they're not microbes that just naturally end up in that heavy fraction because they have heavier DNA. Uh, and also microbes which are significantly increased in abundance in the 13 carbon heavy fraction compared to the 13 carbon light fraction so that we know that they're actually incorporating that 13 carbon label. So these are the most abundant of those microbes we get. Uh, one, uh, one significant, I guess, issue with d 2 is that it tends to overestimate the, in, the, the, the importance of low abundance taxa. So it's important to use a threshold of abundance when you're looking at uh, statistical analysis from de 2 So these are the most abundant that were, came up as being significantly enriched in both of those conditions. Uh, and you can see we have, so common monodaceae, oxalobacteraceae, which are both in the Burkholderia uh, group sorry, Burkholderiaceae group. Um, we also have Pseudomonodaceae, which appeared in the previous data set as well, and Chitinophagiaceae. Um, some of the more slower growing microbes, which were significantly enriched in the endosphere, such as Streptomyces, don't appear here. Uh, it's important to note that this is from the rhizosphere and not from the endosphere. Um, but yeah, there's plenty of great information here, and we're able to identify which microbes are potentially utilizing those root exudates within the uh, plant root microbiome. So that's uh, all I had to say today. So thank you for listening. And a huge thank you to Jake Newitt, who 
I did this experiment with, you know, would have been impossible without him because it's a very labor intensive process. Uh, and also to Dr. Sarah Worsley, who was a postdoc in the lab that taught us about all this stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. That was a great talk. And certainly uh, looking at some of those NMDS plots uh, bring back some memories for me because I spent ages working out some of them. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so we will now move on to our final speaker of the morning. Um, so Adam Lee is from the University of Nottingham. Adam's work is looking at the microbiome of poorly performing piglets and the effect um, of rotavirus in pre-weaned piglets. So over to you, Adam. Hello, good morning. Um, there's a problem in pig production. So I'm looking at uh, pre-weaning piglets um, and their well-being is, is, is quite an important economic and welfare problem because there's um, a, a lot of mortality. So we estimate the mortality of um, pre-weaning piglets to be about 10 to 20 percent of live born pigs. This can happen for very many different reasons. I mean, perhaps it's a function of the genetics where we've selected for increased litter sizes and leaner carcasses, which increase the production, uh, sorry, the proportion of low birth weight piglets that are actually born. Um, and the lower the weight, the more risk these piglets are of actually dying. However, uh, more of an interesting problem to, to us is that some normal weight piglets still piglets don't show any underlying signs of clinical disease, but for some reason they just don't thrive and quite a few of them die. So, you know, we know that adequate uh, milk intake or colostrum intake from, from, from the mothers reduces the mortality rate until they actually wean. So we thought, is, is there something in the microbiome? You know, can we manipulate the microbiome to actually try and improve the welfare and, and, and well-being of, the, of these uh, poorly performing piglets? So can prebiotics be used to manipulate the microbiome? Well, milk sugars or galactooligosaccharides are a major constituent of mammalian milk. We don't digest them uh, in the upper intestine. Uh, what happens is they're actually fermented and utilised by the microbiota in the lower gastrointestinal tract. And they're mainly responsible for stimulating and developing microbiota in neonates. And that's, you know, most mammals, if not all mammals. Fairly simple molecules, uh, typically composed of two to eight galactose units with eternal glucose uh, molecule. They're readily fermented in the cecum and the comb to short chain fatty acids, which we know have beneficial health effects. And they increase fecal lactobacilli and bifidobacteria uh, significantly. Uh, they also decrease some of the um, potential pathogens such as E. coli and clostridia. So we designed a study. We took our poorly performing piglets that were 23 to 26 days old. And these piglets have been removed from their mums because they're receiving suboptimal nutrition from the sow. So under normal conditions, they'd be put in what we call an orphan pen and then they would receive a milk replacer. So very simply, we took half the piglets, put them in an orphan pen and gave them milk replacer. Uh, the other half, we gave them milk placer plus galactooligosaccharides. Still some died. Uh, I got 18 in the control pens and 17 in the GOS pens. So the uh, GOS pigs replaced a complete porcine milk replacer alone, all with 1% weight per weight uh, GOS nutribiotic. We collected the gastrointestinal tract luminal contents and analyzed those by 16S RNA sequencing. I also collected tissue samples for gut architecture assessment and goblet cell enumeration, which is another story. And we also collected uh, tissue samples for gene expression analysis. I'm currently looking at 32 different genes um, after having a reverse transcribed the RNA that we managed to get out of the uh, gastrointestinal tract. 
So 16S microbiome analysis, I uh, used the Illumina MySeq platform. Uh, I did DNA extraction using uh, MP Biomedicals uh, kit, PCR the DNA, gel electrophoresis to see if there was any DNA there, cleaned up, normalized and pooled the DNA using the SQL prep uh, kit. And then I did the library uh, quality control and quantification. Uh, we used um, uh, tape station and qubit to actually get my DNA concentrations. And then I sequenced uh, the DNA on the aluminum I seek. And then I analyzed that using uh, mother. Troubleshooting, there were problems. Excess evaporation from the PCR plate can leave you with not enough sample volume for the SQL prep normalization kit, which means that you don't have enough sample, which may lead to low clustering of DNA on the flow cell of the Illumina MySeq. And if this happens, you, you'll get good quality results but it may reduce the data output. So usually we're looking at about 750K per millimeter squared on the flow cell, but um, anything really you know, below 600 and you're looking at um, reduced data output. However, if you have high clustering, it may reduce the overall quality. So, I mean, this has happened um, a, a couple of times, but we've found ways out of this. So make sure you seal your PCR plate properly. Um, make sure that your pipetting you, when you're using the SQL prep normalization kit is absolutely spotless. And the other problem that we found with the MySeq that Illumina didn't tell us is that the index and read primers need to be thoroughly mixed with the cartridge reagent on, on well 13, 14 and 15. So if you do what's in the Schloss protocol or in Illumina's protocol, which is just like um, pipette the, the primers in, it doesn't work. You actually have to pet out the reagents and then mix the reagents from those wells with the index and read primers in separate PCR tubes and then using very long pet tips, put them back into the cartridge because otherwise it doesn't work. So some results. So um, we're looking at the duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum, the colon, the cecum, and the rectum of these poorly performing piglets. The red is the milk placer alone, the green is the uh, milk replacer and the galactoligosaccharides. And you can see that in every single case except in the rectum, there's a significant degree of separation in the bacterial communities between the control versus the looking, um, sorry, uh, using the methods of you and Clayton and the significance comes from using analysis of molecular variance, which was done in mother. So this was um, the first trial. It's not all of the pigs because we had to separate these trials into one to four trials. So this is just an example. I think this is the first trial where we've got a highly significant difference in beta diversity. I'm not going to show you all of the microbiome analysis because I got 5,000, 6,000 uh, operational taxonomic units, OTUs. What we were particularly interested in were the abundance of lactic acid bacteria. So filtering through the data um, after doing the pipeline analysis, you can see that there's a very big difference in lactobacillus lactococcus and the, throughout the GI tract. We were absolutely stunned by this result and we managed to reproduce this four times in four separate trials. So this is relative abundance. If we wanted to know how significant this was, then uh, I'll come to that in a, in, in a bit. But the other thing we were interested in was the relative abundance of potentially pathogenic organisms. Um, so if we look at the phyla uh, proteobacteria, which harbour a diverse reservoir of, of antibiotic resistant genes as well, um, and, and potential pathogens such as Campylobacter, uh, Shershia, Shigella, Salmonella, and Helicobacter, we found that the relative abundance of, of the Proteobacter was markedly reduced uh, in the goss pigs. 
And if we look at the spirochetes, which uh, is the phylo that contain Trapanema, Spirochetus, Spirochetes, ACA, uh, you know, these, these can cause hemorrhagic disease in pigs and soy dysentery. And you can see that we only really pick those up uh, in the control pigs and not in the pigs that were receiving galactosaccharides. So in terms of there being any significant difference um, throughout the gastrointestinal tract in the abundance of beneficial lactic acid bacteria, we can see that uh, in trial one, we got um, you know, a significant increase in streptococcus. Uh, we've got a significant increase in lactobacillus on all four trials, significant increase in uh, leuconos stock in three trials, and significant increase in bifidobacterium in all four trials. And throughout uh, the gastrointestinal tract, ranging from the upper gastrointestinal tract, from the duodenum straight down to the rectum. Uh, this is using the linear discriminant effect size. Our key messages are that the galactooligosaccharides promote a significant difference in uh, beta diversity throughout the GI tract, that they increase the relative abundance of beneficial lactic acid bacteria, they decrease the relative abundance of potentially pathogenic organisms, and they significantly increase the differential abundance of beneficial Lactic, act, uh, lactic acid bacteria throughout the GI tract, notably lactobacillus, leuconostic, uh, leuconostoc, and the fine bacteria. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam. A great talk again to finish off um, all of the, the presentations this morning. So thank you very much um, thank to you. all of you uh, for speaking. So if I can just ask all the speakers to pop their um, cameras and microphones back on and we'll take some questions. Um, so if, um, if, if you've not already looked, uh, there's been some really great questions already in the um, Q&A box, um, some of which have already been answered by our speakers and some we will go through now. Um, so I'll start, I'll just go with the one at the top of screen at the moment. Um, so for Rebecca, um, so from how how far up the gastrointestinal tract can you measure um, LCN2? So will it only indicate colon inflammation or can you also use it to measure gastric inflammation? And that's from Jennifer McIntyre. Um, sorry, I was typing. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, so in our models, we actually specifically only get inflammation in the colon and also the cecum. Um, and we don't even get it as far up as the small intestine. So, yes, it is measuring colon inflammation, but that's what our models induce. Yeah. Okay. I sort of um, had a question off the back of that as well. And I, I think Katie um, had similar. Why did you choose? Um, the LCN2 as the marker? Did you look at others? Um, I, I know sort of we've been looking at calprotectin um, in pigs. Yeah. So what made you choose that over, over some others? Yeah, so yeah, you're right. We can use calprotectin as well. Um, so we've had more success with the lipocalin ELISA as opposed to the calprotectin ELISA um, in okay. the school. So that's why we measured lipocalin. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, so we will, um, one again from Jennifer, but I guess more to sort of everyone. Um, why are the relative abundance plots to be taken with a pinch of salt? Are they made up of the relative abundance of sequencing reads? So, I mean, does anyone particularly want to grab that one. I, I can take that from yeah. a metagenomic perspective. So in my case, uh, the plot I shared um, is built using, so it's Kraken 2, which identifies the sequencing reason, it identifies um, the taxonomy of them. But I will say from a metagenomics perspective, we don't know what's there. We don't know what we're expecting. It's only as good as the database you're using. Uh, so for some things I found it really great. So Kraken 2 for sort of well-characterized um, 
metagenomes it's great so if we don't have many unknown things but with especially with sewage sludge things there's a lot of uncharacterized things in there um and it doesn't pick up on them very well and they usually end up just uh classed as unclassified or ended up something higher up in the family and something that you're like i don't think that's there i don't think that's likely to be in this community um but maybe somebody else could come at that from a 16s perspective yeah, yeah i can talk about that, yeah, go that for it, Sam. perspective um yeah so i guess with 16s because it's a pcr based method so you're amplifying the 16s gene um there's none of that absolute abundance information there. So, um, for example, when I presented those three root compartments, the endosphere I present, you know, with bars the same size as the rhizosphere and the and the bog soil. But when we do qPCR for absolute abundance, there's orders of magnitude less microbes in the endosphere compared to the other two compartments. So it's just important to know these things so you don't potentially over, you know, over uh, overestimate the importance of things in different compartments, I guess. It's yeah. just the perspective I have on it anyway. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, so let's have a look. I seem to have a lot of questions for Rebecca, but I'll sp spread them out. Um, so one for Adam, um, how did you determine what weight uh, was actually considered to be low birth weight um, for the pigs? Um, well, th th this this was um, a, a also based upon a visual assessment, and, and I'm sorry if I didn't make it clear enough in the presentation. We started off with the premise of, of there being low weight pigs, but actually most of them were not low weight, they were not thriving, which was the point in the first slide that some of them don't have to be underweight to not thrive because we don't know um, of what's causing the problem so there was no significant difference in the weights between my piglets and the ones that remained with the sale we just knew that they weren't thriving well i mean they were at the lower end of the weight scale and um, they were actually weighed they were at the lower end of weight uh, but what they were assessed for was uh, using a, a, a visual score by the animal technicians was appearance, thriftiness, uh, any lameness, scouring, how often they ate, they drank, their behaviour. And this was done by the specialist animal technician each day and those that were considered to be of lower weight and not thriving well, were uh, not feeding well, uh, were actually placed into the orphan pens. Okay, thank you. Um, so we will go, we'll go for a question for Rebecca. This is from Rick. Um, so you mentioned that metabolite analysis is affected by the water content of the feces. Um, is this, uh, is the composition of abundance of, or abundance, sorry, of microbiota also affected um, by that? Um, yeah, so there's been studies showing that stool consistency does uh, correlate with microbiome, like changes in microbiome com composition. And they tend to be stuff that you would expect with inflammation, so like species richness, for example. Um, but it's something we've had to consider specifically for the metabolomic analysis, because when we were setting it up, so this is all being done with the Oxford Centre for Microbiome Studies. And when this was being set up, this was a specific concern <laughs> that they had. Um, so we don't actually know exactly how the water content changes. This is something we are doing alongside all our other analysis. Um, but yeah, so that's why it was specifically in integrated into the metabolomic analysis. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and I'm just gonna throw you another one that's, um, you mentioned that you correlate um, the findings that you have, so sort of between the bacteria, the metabolites and the markers. Um, and a question from Pan Panaraya, sorry if I've pronounced that wrong. Um, how how have you correlated that? Um, yes. This is okay. a slide I haven't got to yet. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm not sure at the moment how we're going to approach the um, the exact technical 
details of the correlation analysis but I yeah so I do so I when I do the processing of the 16s and also the transcriptome mix um, and then I'll have to so I know how to integrate those two things and um, but it's just the integration of the metabolites which is a new venture for us at the moment and um, yes there was actually supposed to be an embo course on multi-omic analysis of the gut microbiome which was perfect uh, but covid got in the way so <laughs> as always at the moment yeah <laughs> thank you um okay so um I'll go across to annabelle one for you um what were the benefits of the kraken 2 so did you try any other databases and decide on that one or yeah, so I think the main benefit of Kraken 2 is it is blazingly fast. Like it will take sort of seconds on a cluster to actually tell you what it is. Um, and I have tried other databases. So Centrifuge is another thing that's quite common. I found that to be pretty much comparable to Kraken 2. And there's also, um, I can't remember who the paper's by now, uh, but there's a sort of a bioarchive paper and somebody has created a different, so you can input different databases into Kraken 2 sort of based on what you think you're going to have to um, categorize. So there's a Kraken2 database, which is a lot of um, metagenomes. Um, it's been built off of them and it has, it, I've had a lot more success um, characterizing certain communities using that one rather than the main one, um, which has been quite useful. And always beneficial when they run faster as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially when you have sort of 500 different uh, species, like, yeah, speed is, yeah. Speed is good. <laughs> yeah, it's something I use as sort of a basis for things further down the line. So it wouldn't just be, I wouldn't see that and be like, okay, that is definitely sort of what it is. I would definitely look and sort of compare it to other things that we've seen. And yeah, it's more of a starting point than sort of in it, like my ultimate answer, which is yeah. quite useful to quickly process things. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Okay, so uh, we'll go over to Sam. Um, so this is from Anton, um, who said, you didn't mention algae or cyanobacteria. Does that mean that they are not present or do not take part in plant microbiome? Um, so I guess for, you know, photosynthetic microbes, um, we're looking in the roots, so we're like under the soil, so obviously there's not much light. Um, and when we take the bulk soil sample, that's from, you know, 20 centimetres underground. So I wouldn't expect to see algae or uh, or cyanobacteria. Um, one thing that often happens when you're looking with plant tissues is, especially when you're doing 16S studies, is those 16S primers are very, very good at amplifying um, chloroplast sequences, which often get assigned as cyanobacteria. So there may you may find that the that your pipeline is telling you there's lots of cyanobacteria in the plant tissue when in fact there's actually none and it's just misassigning those chloroplast sequences um so one thing that's super important to do is to make sure you do like some kind of taxonomy based filtering step and just remove all the chloroplasts from your data set all the cyanobacteria because i mean if you think about it you know biologically the interior of root tissue underground you're not going to find many photosynthetic organisms like cyanobacteria um there may be some in the soil maybe at the surface um i've not specifically looked but yeah often for the actual plant tissues um the databases are quite good at mixing that up so it's good to be aware of that and you know remove them <laughs> yeah. it's the same for mitochondrial as well so yeah, no, that's a, a great tip. Um, and another one for you, Sam. Um, so is it of interest to you to look at nitrogen fractions as well? Um, so for ruminant research, this is uh, this part is quite interesting as it affects metabolism and methane emissions, in theory at least. Um, so I uh, was wondering if you have looked into that too. That's from Panorama again. Um, well, so I guess plants get then nitrogen from the soil um from the nitrogen cycle so i guess it's it's more it, it goes the other way right it's not like the the plants are providing nitrogen to the microbial community i mean they there will be some nitrogen in those root exudates i'm sure um but they get their micro they get the nitrogen from the soil so i think it's definitely something that's interesting to look at in some capacity i'm not sure exactly 
how it may have been done i'm not entirely sure um but for example when we look at the archaeal community in the route it's dominated by ammonia oxidizing archaea which is quite interesting so there's definitely something to unpick there um yeah we haven't looked into it specifically and i mean like atmospheric nitrogen if you were doing some kind of stabilizer dope with you know gaseous nitrogen you would probably just find that all of the nitrogen fixes in the soil are lighting up in your experiment which would be interesting obviously but that's what i would expect um it's kind of more independent of the plant i guess and then that flows back to the plant through the roots so okay. kind of goes the other way yeah thank you um so just looking over at the question box it's great to see some of you already um connecting as well between you claire said that um she's also looking at the microbiota of low and normal birth weight piglets so you've connected with um adam and i know someone earlier connected with uh, Katie, um, so that's great to see. Um, just trying to flick through to see if we have any more questions. We do have a bit more time, so if you do want to pop a question in, please feel free. Let's see if we've got any others coming through. We've all been, all the speakers have been on it this morning and answered a lot of them in the question boxes, which is great. Uh, I have a question for Katie, actually, if that's okay. Yeah, go for it. Uh, you mentioned uh, doing negative and mock controls for your studies. I'm just wondering how exactly you go about doing those. So mock communities, you can purchase uh, ready-made uh, minor bacterial. Um, I'm not sure if you can get archaeal freely available, but there's definitely ones for bacteria. Um, some of the bacterial ones will have a couple of fungi thrown in as well. Um, and you know how much of each one is there. So when you run them, you can correlate yours against it to make sure that you're actually getting what you're supposed to get. And the negative ones will be um, either blank from your DNA extraction or from your library prep, just to make sure that you're not getting anything from uh, reagents. Because there seems to be, especially with low abundant communities, you can get, as you say, PCR bias, getting those uh, contaminants instead of what you're actually looking for. So not so much of a problem in the rumen because it's so complex and there's so much there. But if you've got a low abundant environment, then definitely pop those in. If that answers cool. that for you. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I guess it's the, the kit ohm, as some people call it, right? The microbiome of the kit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So I guess I'd want to throw out to all of you, really, that... I know we've certainly had um, like discussions about the use of uh, chime or mother um, and processing that way. What made um, those of you that use one or the other choose the one that you did choose? So Sam, again, I think you use um, chime if that's right. Um, what made you go with that over mother? Um, I think a lot of it is that I was taught to do this stuff by someone who used chimes so it's kind of like depends on uh the the knowledge you have access to i guess um i think chime i i can't speak for mother because i've not used it but chime has a really really fantastic online community on the forums that are extremely helpful with all sorts of things um and yeah but i guess it's primarily because that's what i was taught to do by the person who was teaching me so <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm in a similar boat because it was it was actually Katie that taught me a lot of um, oh, right, yeah. my stuff. And so we use mother. Um, but Katie, I mean, when you first, obviously you were really new to it or with no one really around that was doing similar. So what made you go with mother in the first place at that point? I think comparing mother and time is a bit like Coke and Pepsi. They both very much do the same job, just in a slightly different uh package I guess but um, for me I was using a Windows computer so mother you can use on Windows uh, chime chime however you pronounce it um, my understanding is that's for Linux really and I think they have uh, a wrapper for Macs but I spoke to IT and asked them whether I could have a virtual desktop to run uh, chime on my Windows computer and they nearly fainted so for me mother was my only option <laughs> Well, that's fair enough, isn't it? <laughs> uh, okay, we've just had another question come in from Jennifer. Um, so other than the benefit of removing the host DNA, 
is there any other benefit of 16S over metagenomics? Um, and what are the benefits of metagenomics over 16S? So the ability to identify species and mutations better. Um, anyone particularly want to go with that? I can jump Annabelle, in the second know, half yeah. a bit more, but yeah. um, <laughs> so I'd say, uh, do you want to do 16S first, Katie? If that's Oh, no, no, go, go, go no, ahead. Sorry, yeah. I, thought, yeah. I thought you'd spoken, which is why. Uh, yeah, so I, I've not used 16X much, to be honest. I think probably the main uh, benefit is the cost. It is significantly cheaper than all of the metagenomic stuff that I've shown today. That That's rather expensive. Um, somebody else may have other pros there. But I'd say for metagenomics, the benefit is you do get all of the sequence there. You sort of capture everything present, even things that don't have a 16S. So quite a lot of you, you might be missing certain key species, uh, depending on the community you're looking at. Um, and it also captures more info. So I, as a lab, we're sort of interested in sort of the functional pathways, how to produce more biogas from this community. We sort of need metagenomics to show the whole picture there, uh, more than just what species are actually there. I will say, um, I know 16S has its biases, but I would argue that metagenomics also has its biases with sequencing. So uh, depending on how you extract your DNA and stuff, you may end up with the abundance value. So this actually goes back to the other question. Abundance might be impacted by that as well. Um, I think that is all I had to say there. But yeah, I'd also actually, the ability to ID species is probably, I don't know, I don't know how well, I think quite closely related species do have sort of closely related 16S sequences there. But um, yeah, <laughs> um, so it's probably a bit easier to identify species. And definitely mutations but that again depends on how well you are actually sequencing the community in the first place and yeah, katie oh, sorry, sorry sam i was just going to say i know katie was asked sort of a similar question that you answered and essentially said it was down to cost that mm -hmm. um that metagenomics wasn't used for your work so yeah, yeah and i think metagenomics as well if you're interested in looking what that community is doing rather than just who's mm -hmm. there there are um uh, things that you can use to try and predict what they're doing from 16S, but you're looking at such a tiny part of the, the genome that metagenomics is the way forward, really, if that's what you're interested in, rather than just who's there. But 16S has its benefits and it's that it's it's a cheap way of doing it, well, cheaper than metagenomics, and it will give you an idea of if that community is changing. But if you want to ask those more uh, in-depth questions, then metagenomics is probably the way forward. And I just say that I agree with Katie on that. I mean, we do we do a lot of 16S, um, and it's we know it's not the be all and the end all, but the quality of the sequences that we get on um, actually most of the data is good enough to put into Blast, and we get a 99.9999999 percent match with um, what, what, what the database that's actually in Blast. So it's very good at actually pointing us in the, in the right direction. And um, we, we find 16S is really good when we've got hundreds and hundreds of samples because we can, we, we can do that uh, really quite quickly on, 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 on one of the um, cartridges from Illumina on the MySeq. So we, we, we find that's the benefit. And then when something really stands out, we can go back to old fashioned micro, microbiology and actually plate it out. And again, there is the cost element. 16S and mother, I think, was the cheapest way, which was why I ended up doing it, because the rest of the research team were. Uh, <laughs> and I feel for you, Katie, I had to teach myself mother. It took me a term. Um, yep. and, and now I can, because nobody helped me, because I was the only person doing it at the time, I think. Uh, so I had to teach myself from the SOP. And there are mistakes in that SOP that I you have to find them out the hard way. Um, now I can probably do from fast Q to actually getting the results out of mother, including beta diversity. I can probably do that in an afternoon now. So if you're tooled up and you know what you're doing, uh, it can it oh, it doesn't take too long. Uh, the first time they they tell you to do it, it's 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 just like an awesome task. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely uh, true, isn't it, Adam? Um, so uh, Sam, did you have, sorry, something to add on that as well earlier? Yeah, I was just going to say on Annabelle's point about identifying 
you know, species level microbes with 16S. I know, for example, for Streptomyces, even full length 16S is not good enough to identify species at all. And you get microbes with multiple copies of the 16S gene, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay, so we've just had, oh, well, we've just had a, a comment come through um, that there are also pipelines that can combine um, time and mother um, and can be complementary. Um, as you can pick and choose depending on uh, the efficiency of alignment. So yeah, I guess it's all just um, trial and error. And like you say, Sam, a lot of it is kind of what you've been taught from from someone else or in Katie and Adam's case, you know, trying it the hard way and uh, you're the ones figuring it out for the, the foreseeable future <laughs> of, of everyone else. Um, so that's currently all the questions that we have got in the box. Um, if anyone does have any more, I'll give you a couple of seconds just to add them in. But if not, um, then I think we'll we'll call it a day at that. Thank you very much to all the speakers today um, for giving your talks. It's certainly been really interesting and hopefully, um, well, I mean, we've already seen some connections between um, attendees um, and, and and the speakers. So yeah, hopefully in some future events, we can have um, a bit more um, uh, sort of discussion if it's um, more uh, or fewer people, a bit more sort of um, intimate <laughs> uh, and, and form closer networks between everyone. So thank you all very much uh, for joining. Um, and yeah, so hopefully see some of you soon.